welcome everyone to our final media briefing on the final day of the fifth plenary council of Australia's final assembly. <laughs> A lot of finals. We've just had our beautiful closing mass. And my name's Jenny Brinkworth. I'm from the Adelaide Archdiocese, where I'm director of communications and editor of the Southern Cross newspaper. And today we're very privileged to have with us three of our plenary council members. In, including Archbishop Timothy Costello, um, Renee Cole Ryan, and Danny Casey. And I'll just, before we go to questions, I'll just give you um, some brief biographical details. Archbishop um, Timothy, I'm sure you will all know, is, not, uh, is a member of the Salesians of Don Bosco and the Archbishop of Perth. He spent the last uh, four years plus as president of the Plenary Council and will next week take on the role of President of the Australian Catholic Bishops' Conference. Welcome. Uh, then we have Renee. Renee is Head of the School of Philosophy and Theology at the University of Notre Dame, Australia. She's been heavily involved in the plenary council process as Chair of a Discernment and Writing Group in 2019 and 20, and a member and part of the council's drafting committee and has had a very busy week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, and Jenny. And finally, we have Danny Casey, who um, has been Director of Schools, Broken Bay, since April 2020. <coughs> Danny's previous roles include the Business Manager for the Catholic Archdiocese of Sydney and Director of the Secretariat for the Economy for Vatican City. He is known by many um, from his role as Chief Executive Officer for the 23rd World Youth Day, held in Sydney in 2008. <laughs> So welcome everyone. I might kick off with one question first to um, Archbishop Timothy. I just wanted to gauge how you felt uh, when there was a standing ovation at the end of the session this morning um, after all that you've been through over the last four years and mm. uh, this week in particular. Yes. What, what was going through your mind when people stood up and clapped and showed their appreciation. Yes, yes. Well, those of you uh, who, uh, or the, the people who were there would have known that I was just a little bit emotional at the end as I formally announced the closing of the council because it's been a long, long journey and a challenging journey, I think, for everybody. So uh, it, was, it was nice to get a standing ovation. I think the standing ovations for everybody involved in the council, not just for the president. Uh, one of the things, I was talking to someone just before, one of the things that is, I think, really remarkable is really the army of people who've been involved in this right from the beginning. Many of them right at the start and are still involved deeply and have been all the way through. So I think it's a, it's a great example of the whole church, in one sense, the whole church, you know, in a representative way, coming together for something really worthwhile. So. As I said when I closed it, I feel a great sense of gratitude. I feel a sense of relief, I must be honest, and also a sense of hope for the future. So, And perhaps the other members want to talk a little bit about how you felt today at the end of it, I guess, because you've both been heavily involved as well. So very similarly, relieved and somewhat emotional. <laughs> I think because we're all a bit exhausted, actually. Um, there has been a lot going on in the last week and leading up to it. I know that one of my fellow chairs would often say it feels like we're holding so much in our hands as we're going through this whole process because obviously there are 300 delegates here but we're trying to speak for the church in Australia thinking very much about the future um, and, some t and that calls for a lot of imagination, a lot of hope and a lot of faith and um, and you know, just realising all of that, for me the moment was when I walked out of the church and I saw a couple of kids standing near the door. That's the time when I really got emotional because I thought, well, that's what we're doing it all for. As I keep telling my children, I'm doing it for my grandchildren, which scares them. <laughs> it's my oldest is 15. But ultimately, um, what we want is to have a church which is thriving, uh, where Christ is really present in Australia. That's that's really what all of this is about. And I think that's probably what's kept us all going throughout a fairly long process mm -hmm. yeah, of about four years. So we're, we're familiar now too with with how it might be done into the future if, uh, as, as we continue down a synodal path. Um, and I think that's very hopeful as well. 
Absolutely. I think uh, they've summed it, Archbishop Tim and, uh, and Renee have summed it up very, very well. It was an emotional morning. Uh, it was wonderful. I think the standing ovation reflects the level of unity that we have. One of the things that really, I think, came through very early on is uh, all of our members did take our responsibility very seriously. We knew this was all about strengthening the faith life. And, and I think one of the things that we got from each other was we all were recognising you know, one thing we have in common is a deep, deep love of the church and a desire to make sure that this hard work uh, results in fruits, the fruits of a more faithful, uh, more faithful community right throughout Australia, a more enlivened church that speaks into the challenges that it's had, uh, but also looks forward with great confidence for the future. And I, I think, uh, I mean, I, we did notice the emotion uh, from Archbishop Tim, but. It well, well deserved because he has worked tirelessly uh, on behalf of uh, of all of us, and uh, his leadership uh, has been uh, has been unwavering as we've gone through this. So we are very, very grateful uh, to what he's done and the way in which he's uh, he's led this this such important mission missionary work. Thank you, Marilyn. Have you got it? Yeah, thank you. Do you want to say who you are? Sir? Oh yes, Marilyn Rodriguez from the Catholic Weekly. Um, I just wanted to ask briefly, I guess, what else happened this morning at the final sort of assembly? In particular, um, three of the observers, uh, the official observers, got up and spoke. Apparently, that was quite powerful. But um, many of us haven't, you know, didn't get the opportunity to hear what they had to say. If you wouldn't mind letting us know. Oh, I can start. Um, yes, we had. Um, I think it was five observers officially. There was Cardinal John Dew from uh, New Zealand, Cardinal Charles Bow from um, Myanmar, um, the Reverend John Gilmore uh, representing the Australian C uh, Council of Churches, um, uh, Ross Castle from um, CCI and of course Archbishop Balvo. Now Ross left a written message but the other four spoke uh, and all spoke very beautifully but out of their own experience. Um, and each, each one offered something very special. I was struck by all of them but I was particularly struck by what uh, John John Gilmore I've got the name yeah. right what jo John Gilmore said he, as he said it once he said I think I'm the only non-Catholic in the room and that could well have been true I'm not sure but uh, he was able to see the the unity that Danny was just talking about he commented on that the the faith uh, and one of the things he said was um, that the, the Christian presence in Australia needs a strong and vibrant Catholic community that each of the churches, we do rely on each other and I guess he was hinting at the fact that maybe we need to learn to rely a bit more on each other and support each other more. He spoke very powerfully but perhaps the others want to say something about a couple of the others? Sure. Uh, I think what struck me when the nuncio, um, when His Excellency our, our nuncio was speaking, was just that we are really connected to the Universal Church and it's quite international. So at the opening mass, someone was commenting that um, until we came to the homily, one might have been um, <laughs> forgiven for thinking that we weren't in Australia <laughs> because we heard, I think, a Canadian accent and a New Zealand accent. And then we had Bishop Columba Macbeth Green giving the homily, which was definitely an so Australian really accent, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if we were just listening to the voices up until that point, um, we, we might have sort of wondered where we were. But, but to me, it really has emphasised that we're not alone. And even in the universal prayer today, we heard the languages, various mm. languages, and we are so blessed in Australia to be a vibrant, united, multicultural community and really the church is the place where anyone from across the entire world can come together and feel that unity. Um, so yeah, I thought that that was very powerful and that's what came through to me in those messages and, and has really been there throughout the council mm -hmm. from that first mass. And I think our two cardinals uh, spoke exceptionally well. Cardinal Dew talked about the learnings for potentially a similar experience that might be there in uh, in New Zealand. And uh, yeah, the cardinal uh, presented some, some beautiful gifts to those who've worked so hard to behind the scenes. And uh, uh, Archbishop Tim mentioned that uh, that early on. I know, uh, along with many members, I was one of many that we were always thanking those who were wearing yellow tags uh, because they were working day and night and had done all the way through to make this seamless so we could concentrate on the work at hand and to see some recognition and appreciation I think was uh, was also a wonderful special moment from this morning. 
just on that issue of unity, and, and it came through really strongly within the plenary, that then externally some of the media coverage and is quite polarised. Mm. Um, and sometimes that just depends on which person is writing the story. But there's also this sort of perception and about disunity and polarised views. So how do we, and obviously the events during the week helped spur some of that. So going forward from here, how do you kind of tr change that perception when you have had such a great experience in the end? Mm -hmm. Did you want to speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Look, I, I think uh, it's very difficult if you're not in the room, if you hadn't experienced everything, to, to you could take a, a particular perspective at a point in time. You know, a long flight where a lot of great work in terms of where we've landed had come and was going through. It's not, it wouldn't be un unexpected that we might have a little bit of turbulence uh, along the way. But at never at any moment did I think that compromise the unity which bound us together. There was a deep love of the church for every member in that room. Uh, there was a deep love of trying to enliven the church through that particular process. Now, we may have seen things differently. Ultimately, what, what happened, I think, in that process was that it was strengthened by what we were able to achieve. It actually said, you know, we hadn't quite landed in a particular area where we needed to land. And ultimately, through the very hard work of my colleague Renee here and, and, uh, and the others on the drafting committee, actually captured in a much clearer, more succinct, and much more direct way some points of concern to the point where there was great peace in the room uh, about the way in which we landed. We could never have landed there if we hadn't have had uh, the turbulence in the middle of the week. But I think to conclude and just focus upon what happened in the middle of the week misses, to, to a large extent, the great gifts that are going to flow from the hard work that's been done uh, right throughout this plenary. Thanks, Danny. Um, so I would agree with that. I, I often think of a wonderful quote from St. Augustine where he talks about how some of the best things that we have in this world come under pressure. So he talks about how you have to press olives to get the oil out of them and you have to, and that it felt to me like we were in a moment of pressure, but it was a very good pressure because it actually forced everyone, and I, um, in a good way, to really say what was in their minds and on their hearts. And what we ended up doing was hearing from a whole range of experiences and realising that even if one person hadn't experienced a certain thing, then someone else had. And somehow that's what had to be captured. And so I think that's what the drafting committee, um, the drafting team ended up coming up with in <coughs> in actually a, a statement that m that better captured this particular issue, which is a which is a, a, a you know an issue of our time, um, so the peacefulness that followed what had been that moment of turbulence was even more valuable to everyone in there because there had been the turbulence in the first place. Um, so I think that it's a good story if you can point out polarization, but a better story is pointing out that there was this friction, turbulence and then peace. Mm -hmm. And that was um, really that peacefulness that, that only Christ can bring. Yeah. Uh, and I would just add two things very quickly. I think it shouldn't have surprised us that we reached that point uh, or that that kind of a thing happened. I would have been rather concerned if the week had just gone on in a very calm and untroubled way and everyone was nice to each other. Being nice to each other is very important, obviously. But that, you know, the tensions and, the, and the, the, the differences of view and those kinds of things, which are a part of the reality of the church, everybody knows that. If they hadn't surfaced in some way, I think people might have got to the end and said to us, it took you four years and this is all you could come up with. Mm -hmm. But we had to face something very difficult and through, I think, the, the goodwill of everybody in the plenary assembly and also the skill of those who were leading us and assisting us, we were able to find our way through. And I think we got to a point where we were able to accept we can't necessarily say everything yet that everybody wants us to say, but we have been able to say some very, very valuable things together. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. The Pope has often spoken about the fact that discernment can sometimes lead you to the point where you say, we need more discernment because we're not quite there yet. 
And I think that's a very important thing for us to learn. And if I could just be a little bit naughty, uh, I think, um, I remember, I think it was at the Synod of the Family, Pope Francis commented on the very thing that we're just talking about, the difference between the experience of those in the room and what was being reported outside. He said, it seems that there were two synods going on, one inside the Synod Hall and one out there in the public. I don't know that that's the case here, but the real, the real plenary council happened inside the room uh, and the members of the plenary council are going to be the best ambassadors for going back to their own local communities and dioceses and what have you and, and sharing the full story with people. I think that's quite important. Maybe just one, one final comment on that. That uh, where we started. The, the standing ovation reflected the level of unity, reflected the, the, the peace and joy in the room from where we'd landed uh, through, from that. that that's, you know, what, what happened in midweek is, is not what we're, what we're talking about, not what we're feeling now. It's, it's, it's where, where we've landed. Gavin. Yeah, you know, Gavin Abraham from the Bishops' Conference. So, a question for you, Danny, mostly, I think. But um, sure. there's been some discussion leading up to the assemblies around how this was the biggest moment for the church from World Youth Day, since World Youth Day. You know that better than most of us. <laughs> I don't know if you've had a reflection on whether, you know, where this fits into the life of the church 14 years on from World Youth Day, and if you think this can be a moment like World Youth Day was that helped. Um, maybe shift focus and, and um, reinvigorate the church in Australia as World Youth Day did? Well, look, Gary, it was very moving to see the, uh, those images of World Youth Day uh, yesterday morning. Uh, I, I realise the emotions are still, uh, still, still pretty raw after many, many years because it, we, everyone works so hard uh, to, to deliver change, to actually re-enliven the faith, particularly of young people. And it's not dissimilar at all, the experience we've had in the four years leading into the plenary and then the experience of the two assemblies and the one ju just just concluded. So, yeah, I absolutely hope that it continues with that momentum where, you know, it's OK to enliven the church, it's OK to challenge, it's OK to question, but it's all about bringing, uh, bringing souls closer to God. I mean, we've got to enhance the faith life. Uh, of our uh, of our community of our country, we used to say in the World Youth, Youth Day preparations that that what our mission <coughs> is here is to bring souls closer to God, and uh, and in fact it's exactly the same mission we've got uh, in the in the plenary council. <coughs> I'm very sorry, it's not COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps I'll just ask uh, one of you a little bit about the next stage, the implement and what happened in terms of the decrees and um, the acts today and um, what happens now, because a lot of people won't know who weren't there today, what, what the next stage is. Uh, well, I can say a few words about it and other people might add something. Um, this morning during the session, one of the big things that we did was to sign uh, the decrees. Uh, all the bishops, as part of the the rules, if you like, around plenary councils that the bishops have to sign the decrees. Uh, so that was done. Now all of the material, the, the decrees, all of the documentation from both assemblies uh, called altogether the acts of the plenary council, they all have to be collated together. And that's going to happen over a few months. I think it's going to take time. There's an enormous amount of material. Um, and, and in a sense, I think in, in my role as president, I don't have to do it, thank goodness, but I have to make sure that it's done. But that will be done by these other wonderful people like Father David Ranson and Bishop Shane and those people. It will then go to, to the Bishop's Conference in November. It will be received by the Bishop's Conference. We're not going to revisit the whole thing and say we don't like that or we want to change this. But it will be received by the Bishop's Conference and then transmitted to Rome. Uh, and it was mentioned in, in, in Mass this morning uh, that we now entrust the work of the Plenary Council to the discernment of the Holy Father. Uh, and that's part of Pope Francis's understanding of synodality and collegiality. We, we've all listened to each other. We've <laughs> shared our uh, faith stories with each other. We've worked together to find some ways forward. We do need the reassurance of the Universal Church that we, in doing all of this, we are remaining in communion with the Universal Church. And that's the... That's the role, ultimately, of the Holy Father and those that he um, asks to help him in that. Once that happens, uh, then that will be communicated back to the church in Australia through the Bishops' Conference 
and the bishops will then formally promulgate the decrees. Uh, and in a sense, I guess that's when the main game starts because that will then uh, be a green light for each diocese and local community to begin to ask the, the fundamental question, what is this going to look like in my local situation or in our local situation? So for me as the Archbishop of Perth, we have one context. Bishop Columba <coughs> in Wilcannia Forbes has a very different context. And what can be done in Wilcannia Forbes won't be the same as what can be done in Perth and vice versa. So we've been operating, if you like, at the level of the, the, the church in Australia. Now we have to start operating at the level of the local church. And how do we bring alive in our context uh, the decisions of the Plenary Council? And I would also say the vision of the Plenary Council. There are the decrees, and as part of the decrees, the opening statements, reflections in each of the sections that we dealt with uh, will be included in those decrees. They're kind of vision statements or, or, or um, <coughs> you know, aspirational statements about how we might move forward and what we might achieve. They're quite beautiful. And I would hope that certainly my plan in Perth, that we would have a diocesan synod and we certainly take seriously the decrees and whatever legislation comes out, but we will also take very seriously the aspirations that have emerged and ask ourselves, now, how do we bring those alive in our diocese? So, so there's a long way to go. Um, we haven't quite had a Vatican Council, but we're still implementing, implementing Vatican II after 50 years. I don't think we'll implement the Plenary Council in six months or in, in a few years. It's going to take time to, to bed down, if you like, in the local scene. And I guess in some places a lot, it is already happening, some of the oh, things absolutely. that are in there. It's not like you have to wait. Exactly, exactly, um, yes. Danny, you may have experienced it in, me, oh, okay. so, in Broken Bay diocese or schools and that. Well, certainly in, in, uh, in Broken Bay, uh, Bishop Randazzo has made it really clear that he's looking, uh, for really following this week, for it to help underpin some of the further continued pastoral discernment work that we've got underway. There's a great renewal happening uh, across many parts of our diocese and I've got the privilege of working with Bishop in the school system as we really do refocus on uh, delivering, making sure every child entrusted to our care uh, comes to know Christ, to love learning and to be the very best they can be so that they can achieve the purpose which God put them on the earth and that's what's driving uh, us and our school system. And there's great learnings from uh, and, and, and pointers. This is all really important discernment and material that uh, we, 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 I think one of the things I reflected on this morning as we went through the process is just the rigours around planning to get there and the rigours that will go forward uh, over the months ahead. But I don't think there's an appetite at all, I didn't sense in the room, to just waiting for everything to be uh, to be formally sanctioned in the months and months ahead, but to take the discernment, the learnings, the, the, what, we, what we've all discovered by the listening uh, process, this has been guided by the Holy Spirit, and have that inform our, our pastoral priorities uh, <coughs> immediately. Uh, indeed, that's what we've been uh, trying to do in Broken Bay, and uh, Bishop's made it clear he'd like to continue, very similar to, to what uh, Archbishop Tim had just outlined. If I can speak. <laughs> I'm very um, sorry about the um, the coughing fit. So um, to me, it was really interesting to listen to one of the Pariti, um, just in a side conversation, who said that basically once the once we had accepted the decrees and of the prior council, uh, so we had to actually move to to accept that they had been I don't know there was a very formal word for abrogated. 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 We had abrogated them. We are now in the era of the fifth plenary council of Australia. So for 80 years there, we were in the era of the fourth plenary council of Australia. So there is uh, certainly a, a moment of history mm. that we can celebrate here. Absolutely. And many of us were joking about how we better be careful what we say because somebody's PhD or maybe there are five PhDs or something in um, looking at all of the historical records of the moments that we've had in the last weeks and in the preparation of, of all of the documents that led up to this time. So, mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, and, and we had the photograph on the steps of uh, the, our beautiful cathedral here, which was quite wonderful, with everyone lined up. And mm -hmm. um, I know that it wasn't the Second Vatican Council, but it did remind me a lot of the photos of the Second mm -hmm. Vatican Council with all those wonderful white mitres. Yes. Yeah, and then the strong presence of the laity, which is a realisation of the vision of the fathers of the Second Vatican mm -hmm. Council. So yeah. there have certainly been some amazing moments this week for us to share. Yeah. Can, can
Could I just ask a question of Archbishop Tim? Does the abrogation now mean that you can go to the movies? Is that true? Is that <laughs> Apparently it, it does. I didn't know that I wasn't able to go to the <laughs> movies before. So it's, it, for me it would be a question of asking for forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, Archbishop Coleridge pointed out that one of the decrees that has now been abrogated is that clerics shouldn't be going to the pictures. So we might be able to reinvigorate the cinema industry after the COVID crisis. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I think Marilyn's got one. Yeah, it might sound like quite a long question and, and it's not quite clear in my mind what I'm asking, <coughs> but if you'll bear with me. Um, today at the Mass in the homily, uh, this is the question's for all, all of you, but really it was, it was Archbishop um, Tim, Tim's um, beautiful words he spoke um, about the call to holiness and that we're all still learning how to engage in this very deep listening, mutual listening. And he also spoke so beautifully at the end about um, the attitude and the words of, of Mary at the Annunciation. And it, it reminded me that during the week I was speaking to one of the bishops here who, who said he really appreciated those morning uh, liturgies because they gave a space for people to stop and reflect at the start of the day. He said there was something spe special there, but he did feel like he wished there had been a still greater emphasis on interior conversion through this week. Um, and I just wondered if you wanted to say something about that, whether you would, I guess, uh, agree or what you think about that idea that our own interior conversion as baptised Catholics is as important as establishing the structures and, and all the <coughs> things we're looking at discerning what, how to implement in the mm. next phase, but it's something we could start on straight away. Um, and it, uh, yeah, I guess basically want to get some thoughts about that. Well, I, you've referred to the homily, so I'll, I'll start. Um, I think it's important for us to remember um, that when the bishops originally conceived of the idea of an event, we didn't know quite what it would be. In fact, the idea of a plenary council was mooted originally, and I don't think most of the bishops were too clear on exactly what that would be or what it would involve. We didn't go down that path initially. We went down the path of, some of you will remember, the Year of Grace. And the Year of Grace was very much inspired by Pope John Paul II's Novo Millennio in Aunte. And at the heart of that document was the invitation to begin everything afresh from Christ and to contemplate the face of Christ. And I quoted him this morning in my homily. It was actually from that letter. And he, in the, in, in the bigger context, uh, Pope John Paul II was talking about the church's mission and he said, our mission will be hopelessly inadequate unless we've first contemplated the face of Christ. And so I talked about the contemplative gaze. And I think that's another way of, of talking about the call to conversion. Um, we're not just doers, you know. We've got to have something deeper going on. I, I agree with the comment that one of the members made to you. The, the, and, and Cardinal Jew mentioned it this morning in his address. The beauty and the power of the prayers with which we began each day were very much a, a call to interiority. Um, so even though uh, you know it, it may not have emerged as as uh, explicitly, if you like, uh, as this call to interior conversion, which is very important, um, uh, it's kind of I, I, guess, I guess for most people, maybe we should have mentioned it more explicitly. For, but for most people, it's understood. Uh, and as I say, certainly in the bishops' minds, having decided on the year of grace, behind the year of grace was the idea that there are so many challenges facing the church. This was, 2012 was the year of grace. So many challenges facing the church then, even more facing the church now. And, and we had this deep instinct at the time that we were, as a church, we weren't yet ready to tackle them. And in fact, we had to step back from them and focus on what was most important, and that is gazing on the face of Christ. So I think, really, it's there, uh, and it's there in the um, inspiration of the plenary council, and I think it was there in the prayers this too. But there's no doubt. I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, there'll be no change, no renewal, no growth, unless there's change and renewal and growth within each one of us. I, I couldn't agree with that more. 
When, um, when the drafting committee were working on some proposals for an agenda for the council, there was a thought at one point that we might talk about structures yeah. of governance first, but several of us argued that actually that comes last. So what we ended up with on the agenda was first of all, um, a call for reconciliation. It's actually a very liturgical pattern, mm. I think, that we begin mass with recognising our sinfulness and that we want to repent in order to turn toward God. Um, and then the, the agenda went to what it means to be missionary disciples. It then followed from there to look at all sorts of different ways in, in, in which to do that. Um, and ended with a call to conversion. Now, we ended up actually switching around the agenda midstream mm. because we realised that that needed to change around. I thought that uh, from the comments this morning, someone made the comment that that was actually really good and showed that we could do that. Um, yeah. I, I, so that, that was very interesting. But, um, but always the, everything is about Christ. So first we turn to Christ, then we figure out what we have to do rather than saying, well, we've got to do something and then sort of scrambling and hopefully we find Christ in the middle of everything. So I think that, yeah, very much that has been the way that the plenary has tried to, um, to operate with that call to prayer. Um, often mass in the evening. There was one, one day when it was mass in the morning and then obviously beginning and ending with mass as well. So, yeah. Um, for me, one of the most beautiful moments of that morning prayer was uh, when we had the Litany of Saints. Mm. It was absolutely gorgeous in a contemporary setting and just hearing all of those names from throughout the ages. It was just really, really moving. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, I, I, yeah, I agree with the comments made uh, in particular, the, the observation that if we're going to be successful in mission, there needs interior conversion. Yeah, you know, we need to live out the universal call to holiness. We need to witness uh, in, in our own spaces, uh, structures will follow that once we've we've uh, been committed, and and I think that uh, yeah, mission may, may well need some structures uh, in time. And I think it was well placed that we started talking structures much towards the end uh, for that very reason. But also, I think in organising, apart from the beautiful morning liturgies that we did have, there were gaps in the day. Uh, and uh, the Blessed Sacrament was available uh, in the crypt of the cathedral uh, and many, many were there on a regular basis, particularly at times when we were had a few tremors or a bit of turbulence. People were seeking the guidance and the comfort and support uh, in uh, in that setting. And, and I think those numbers increased uh, throughout the week. So it, th there, there was plenty of opportunity to make sure we were nourishing uh, our interior life uh, throughout this because that's what was guiding uh, our, our, our insight and judgments uh, that we were making. I think we've got time for one more question from Gavin. Yeah, just you, you've each got your own contexts, you know, families and, um, uh, and dioceses and universities and what have you. Um, just wondering about uh, when you go back to them today, um, what's going to be the one thing that you take back with you and say, this is, this is uh, it may not be more, maybe more than one, but this is the thing that I've taken from this week of, and what it means to, to my context as a family or Well, I, I'll, only because I'm holding the microphone, I might go first. Then. Look, I, I think that I'll go back with a great sense of hope and enthusiasm for the future. Uh, and and it, it's built upon uh, many, many different experiences of this week. The, the, the big one being the sense of unity that we had, the, the fact that I was sitting alongside people who had a completely different perspective. We hardly knew each other at the beginning. Uh, and our preconceived ideas about where, where we may have been coming from was actually quickly melted away to the point where we said, we've actually got some things in common here. We want to grow the faith life in this country. We love the church and we want to help. And, we're, and we want to listen first and provide our perspective and then together come to an agreed position. And I think that, that creates enormous momentum uh, for the future. And yet we'll be taking that home uh, to, uh, to my family to, to talk about just the wonderful future that lies ahead. And in the Catholic schools context in Broken Bay, we're going to continue to, uh, to call to witness uh, in every space, every day, because uh, one of the great things I think that a Catholic education can do, and it came through in, the, in, uh, in uh, many of the examples and testimonies we've heard throughout this, this week, is just the powerful witness of parents, the, the powerful witness that can be uh, done for students going forward. And we, we, we need to make sure that our education system supporting the formation of, uh, of families as much as we are of, uh, of children, obviously, in close collaboration with, uh, with the local clergy local parish sitting. 
I think there's a lot, um, and I'm not sure that I've unpacked it all yet myself. So I'm sort of sitting here thinking, is it that or is it that or is it that? <laughs> so, um, so a few things. One would be probably um, I think that I've grown in this week, and I don't say that in any prideful way. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's shown me how much more I've got, you know, further I've got to go. Um, but basically trying to start and end with prayer, I think that that's something the rhythm of this week has really, um, has really emphasised to me how important that is. I'm a, I'm a woman, obviously women were spoken about a lot, so really thinking about the teaching of the church on women, we have so much to draw on. We have, you know, Mary, the mother of God, is a woman. So I think I'll just keep contemplating that and thinking about how many strong um, women there are and have been in the church. At St Mary's Cathedral, um, at the very back of the church, there's a beautiful altar there with different doctors of the church, so female doctors of the church. And I find my found myself quite drawn to that space um, during this week. So we certainly have some wonderful examples and this is an area where we need to continue to think. So as a philosopher, I'll be doing more work there. And as a head of school of, uh, um, of the F School of Philosophy and Theology at Notre Dame, um, I'll be working with colleagues to really make sure that we are helping as much as possible to form young people to think through the pressing issues of the day so that they're prepared for the future um, so that they can carry on our tradition in that way. I'm a bit like Renee in saying that uh, you know we only finished an hour or so ago and it's going to take a long time to process it all. But um, I think the, the process of discernment that has developed and grown over the four years of this journey uh, provides us with an enormous opportunity for uh, a way to move forward. Um, you know, I think Australians can often be very practical people and we get together and we have a meeting, we've got to have an outcome, or we've got to have a decision and we just do that. Um, and I think in the first assembly, and I think in the first assembly people found it quite difficult in the second assembly, we were more used to it. Uh, we had to stop and slow down and take time and genuinely listen and then pause for a moment and consider what we'd heard and then feed back what we thought we'd heard from other people and gradually sort of not grope our way towards uh, a, 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 an advanced position, but work our way towards an advanced position. I suspect there's something there for parish pastoral councils to operate in a slightly different way, school boards to operate in a slightly different way, certainly diocesan pastoral councils to operate in a slightly different way. Less of the, you know, well, we've got our maintenance committee and we've got our social committee and we've got this committee and that committee. That's all good. But is that really the main game? Or are we trying to answer that that key question of the, the council? What is God asking of us at the moment? And I think that what we've done together over the four years is giving us a new way of entering into that space and trying to discern not what's the most practical thing to do, or they're good questions, but in the end, what's the most God-focused thing to do for us at the moment? I, I think there's enormous potential for that in the life of the church. Um, Many people have said to me, and I don't really agree with this, but many people have said to me, I don't care what comes out of the plenary council, but the fact that we've done it the way we've done it, with this dialogue and listening, that's a new promise for the church. I agree with that. I do care what else comes out of the plenary <laughs> council. But I think that those people are right. You know, Even if nothing else were to emerge, the fact that we've learned a new way of working together and being together to try and catch the voice of the Holy Spirit. I think that's an enormous gift to the church. Mm. Well, that's a good way to end, I think. And I know people have got planes to catch. Um, so thank you very much for coming here and sharing your insights into this pretty amazing journey. And uh, yeah, go well. <laughs> thank you very much.